about, but I'm going to give you some more uh, details on the uh, recent Atlas uh, measurement. Um, you actually, if you have any questions about this measurement at all, you're in luck because both of the analysis contacts, the chair of the editorial board, and one of the top conveners who approved it, as well, supposed to be here, I don't see Marcel yet, but... <laughs> So you absolutely shouldn't get any question where you get the answer that you might get at other conferences where the person speaking doesn't know about it. If we don't know the answer to a question, you've asked a very, very good question. Okay, so um, we talked a lot about the introduction to all this kind of stuff yesterday, so I'm going to whiz through it. But I wanted to highlight something I found recently when I was reading um, back background to Bell Loopholes, actually, which was um, I was trying to look for what the earliest reference was to trying to do um, this kind of physics with, uh, with, well, not with photons, basically. Um, and I found a reference to a paper, well, a preprint by a guy called Henry Stapp, um, which actually got, he made public in 1976, but the source was very clear that it actually came out before, um, in 1968, before the CHSH uh, paper was even out, actually, and before the first measurements, which proposed uh, measuring spin correlations in proton-proton scattering to do Bell-type tests. Um, and it struck me that even though it's not the same physics, obviously the title is almost the same as what we're doing in Atlas if you just add top quarks in there. So I quite like this as an early reference to the fact that people have been considering doing this kind of physics with LHC-like uh, setups for quite some time. <clears throat> um, yeah, this is probably one of the first papers I've ever been involved in with where the news articles came before the papers actually come out. So we, we have far more uh, popular science journal articles out than the actual measurement itself. Um, I only mention this because I do like to point out that it takes a long time to do a measurement in Atlas. We've actually been doing this for nearly three years now, well before even the Nobel Prize was awarded. So <clears throat> this isn't by design, this is somehow accidental. Although that isn't to say that um, Joav and I, the analysis context, haven't um, played up to it a little bit by uh, doing some of these interviews. In fact, if you follow followed Clara Nella, she does a lot of LHC public outreach for stuff like this on TikTok. Um, and this video got... Um, <laughs> is, is Jov and I, just after the first presentation of this in the top conference, uh, we've got 11,000 views. This is actually one of our worst performing videos. So I don't know what that says about people's interest in general popular science about this, but anyway, it's, uh, we enjoyed it. Um, this is a plot also we saw yesterday, but I thought I'd show a, 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 a bit more um, comprehensive one. Just showing the amount of interest in this kind of physics that's gone over time. So if you, if you talk about... Um, Bell type measurements or any kind of quantum information measurements that involve hadron colliders in some way. Um, if you stretch this x axis all the way back, there are, you do see an occasional paper once every 10 years or so. But it's very true to say that recently this, um, this has been uh, increasing. So I think yesterday we saw the number of citations for uh, this paper here uh, versus time. But I also wanted to highlight that it's not just LHC papers. Um, there are now an increasing number of papers coming out um, to do with. Uh, non-LHC physics, so I've seen papers um, talking about reinterpreting um, DAISY, uh, uh, HERA data, and also future uh, collider proposals and stuff. So it's, uh, it's broadening just beyond LHC, which is always very nice to see. Um, and also this plot was made um, in the summer, so actually this, this bar here isn't complete yet. I think if we, I, I at least off, off the top of my head know an extra four papers that should go into here, so it's probably somewhere up here by now. So, I mean, I personally hope this exponential uh, curve continues. Um, right, so, um, okay. We don't really need to do all this stuff because we did it all yesterday, but it's my usual first slide. So um, what is quantum entanglement? At least the way we're talking about it, we're only talking about quantum entanglement in the sense of calculating probabilities, um, in this case related to spin correlation. We're not talking about Bell-type tests, and I just wanted to keep this slide in just to really make the point that we're not talking about doing Bell-type tests with this measurement. Um, um, but why do we care about doing this at the LHC? We talked about this yesterday as well. Um, one thing I did want to mention that I'm not sure actually came up, but came up a lot when we were having the paper reviewed, is um, entanglements have obviously been measured in many, many different ways before. I think we heard about tardigrades yesterday, uh, diamonds, mesons, um, and those are all in composite sort of systems, and also in free particle systems like photons. But I think it's also true to say that top quarks is the first time that it's been measured in unbound fundamental fermions. So I think even in the case of most electron measurements, these are always in solid state things where it's um, in atomic systems, so they're not truly free particles. Um, neither are top quarks really, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but it's also, um, uh, this was talked about yesterday, top quarks are, even when we produce them quite close to threshold, um, are, are quite relativistic. Um, even when we're really close to the MTT bar um, threshold, the actual beta, the average beta, or the, you know, you get betas of up to about 0 0.4 when you're looking at the kind of selection we're doing. So it's not to say that they're completely at rest, um, which was a topic that also came up yesterday. So more interestingly, why does quantum entanglement manifest in TT bar events at all, or how are we trying to access it? Um, so 
If you've ever seen a slide on top quark physics, I'd be very surprised if you haven't um, seen this uh, a version of this slide, but we always like to remind people that top quark is extremely heavy, like crazy heavy. Um, it's about as heavy, we used to say it was as heavy as a gold atom, um, but then we remeasured the mass and it's actually closer to a rhenium atom. And okay, rhenium's literally the most boring element, there's nothing you can say about it. Gold used to be shinier. So it was more fun to say that slide at the Teratron, but at the LHC it's closer to rhenium. But still, it's, it's pretty crazy to have this much mass contained in what is, a, 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 a point light particle with no dimensions. And this uh, super high mass leads to some really interesting um, properties. So um, if you just do some very hand wavy calculations of the various time scales involved in what we're talking about, um, the top's lifetime is like 10 to the, on the order of 10 to the minus 25 seconds. Um, and this is much shorter than time scale for hadronization to occur and more importantly for the spins to be, uh, spin information to be decorrelated. So when I say that tops are fermions that are an unbound system, of course all quarks obey QCD confinement, but the top um, doesn't live long enough to experience any of these QCD-like effects. So we claim that it's a, a, um, a free quark for all intents and purposes. So the QCD has no time to dilute the top quark's quantum numbers, which is why we can access them, and it transfers them directly to the decay particles, which is obviously what we look for in our, in our collider detectors. Um, and the, the vehicle we've chosen to try and test quantum information in this first attempt is the, is the top quark spin, and that's because we have a very long history of measuring things like spin correlation in TT bar events at the LHC and even um, at the Tevatron. So, um, because tops are produced mostly by, uh, almost entirely by QCD, they're not intrinsically polarized in a particular direction, but their spins are still correlated and we can measure the spin correlation. Um, so, okay, I, I always put here the double differential cross-section um, for top product production. And this is the cross-section as a function of the angle of the tops decay product. So this theta is the angle of one of the tops decay products with respect to some uh, basis that you've chosen. Um, so um, we have two terms here for the polarization and one term for the spin correlation. Um, these B terms here are basically zero in the, um, in the standard model, so you, know, you can forget about them and you only really care about the spin correlation parameter here. And we've measured this to death at the LHC. I mean, I did it for my PhD thesis 10 years ago, so it's, it's been done many, many, many times. Um, but the real key point is that to access the spin information, as we talked about a lot yesterday, what you really need to do is to measure the um, angular distributions of the decay particles. And it really does matter how you measure these angles because the amount of observable spin correlation, the value that the C takes, is really dependent on you making a smart choice for what uh, angles you choose to measure things with. So because the tops aren't at rest, especially inclusively if you don't try and look at the threshold region but look about uh, across the whole spectrum, um, the tops are quite relativistic. So the beam line basis, so this regular Cartesian basis, or okay, you could express it as um, the lab frame basis in cylindrical polars like we do at the LHC, this PT eta phi, but in the lab frame. Um, this is useless for spin correlation. The C parameters are basically zero. You get no sensitivity to spin correlation at all. This just isn't a useful reference frame to be measuring top spins. Um, what we talked about yesterday a little bit, but I'll reiterate again, is if you boost into um, the top's rest frame and you take its, its direction, this K axis that we usually call K, um, as one of these bases and you construct some uh, coordinate system around that, this is a much smarter choice. Um, but it's not perfect. Um, this, this doesn't give you a, you know, a nice spin correlation of, of one. Um, you still only can get reach um, moderately. Um, so, okay, here you get spin correlations of basically 0%. But even with this one, the spin correlations, depending on which axis you're measuring it along, still don't go above around about 30%. And you can play tricks with this. You can try and re um, reduce the phase space into an area where you expect this is going to be a much more sensible basis. Um, which is essentially what we've done in the entanglement measurements so far. And e but even there, you see that these values only get to about 40 to 50%. It's really hard to find some optimal basis that, that can really have super sensitivity to spin. Um, but the goal, of the, uh, the goal of Atlas is not to measure the full spin density matrix as a function of these angles, although that would be nice, and CMS have done it, I should say. Um, Atlas have also done it at run one, but we don't talk about it very often. Um, the goal is just to measure this D parameter that was introduced in Twan's talk yesterday, um, which is the, the trace of this spin density matrix. And essentially, what we're looking for is, is well, um, experimentally, we don't actually measure D. What we measure is the cosine of the angles between the two, two of the top's uh, decay particles. I'll talk about which ones we choose in a minute. But the angle between these two decay particles in their parent top rest frame, which is essentially saying, I'm going to use this kind of axis here. Um, and as um, Juan proved nicely yesterday, um, an observation of a, of a D parameter that's less than minus a third is a sufficient condition to say that you can only describe the system with, um, with quantum effects. You couldn't do it with classical probabilities. 
So what we've done is we've measured this D in TT bar events using 140 inverse vector bounds of 13 TV data. That's basically the full LHC run two data sets. Um, so this is the plot that I think we saw one version of this plot yesterday, um, but this is just reiterating the point about, um, uh, that was made yesterday about it, it matters in what region of phase space you look if you care about entanglement. So this is a scattering angle versus the MTT bar. Um, I think this is the, the plot I took is the one which is the sum between the QQ bar and the glue and gluon fusion. But basically what you see is when, these, um, when this color map is you know, red, high color, um, you, uh, you basically have um, uh, entanglement. And when it's in these blue regions, you don't. So from an experimental point of view, all you care about is how do I... I don't want to measure this entire spectrum because I won't be sensitive enough to entanglement, and I'll show that in a minute. I want to be able to select these regions here. So there's two ways you can do this. You can either pick very close to threshold at low MTT bar, or you can pick very high um, MTT bar. Um, there are reason, experimental reasons for doing one or the other. In this case, everything is um, you know, on shell and pretty well behaved, and we have very good control over our, um, our, our uncertainties. Um, in this region here, you um, end up having to look for um, more exotic phenomena like boosted jets. So things become, there's more energy in systems, things become more collimated, and it can be a bit more difficult to separate the, um, the various objects in the detector. That's not to say that we're not going to look here um, uh, entanglement in the future, but for a first attempt, it's just experimentally easier to access this region here. So that's why we, we picked this. So this is, this is that same kind of plot, but only um, with the respect to MTT bar, and it's now plotting the, the D on the y-axis. <coughs> So basically what you're seeing here is the effects of entanglement being observable. So this is integrated across um, all the, um, uh, the phase space. So as you put an upper cut on MTT bar, so if I say I only want to take events where the, the, top, the invariant mass of the top pair was 400 GV or lower, I end up with this D and 500 here and so on. And basically what you see is when you get to about 550 GV, depending on how you do the calculation, you cross over from this point where you can't then say that there's a strong signal of the tops being entangled in that region. I should also point out, I'm being a bit loose with, the, uh, with how I'm phrasing this here, it's not that all the tops below this point are entangled, it's an ensemble of, of different spin states, right? It's just saying that uh, below this point you expect to be able to see that there are the, the effects of entanglement, that at least enough of the tops were entangled that you can say unambiguously that we, we've seen something. Um, so this looks very nice. Um, it looks kind of obvious what you would do as an experimentalist here. You'd think, okay, I'll just put a cut at 550 GeV and take all these events and woohoo. Or like maybe I cut at 450 GeV and then great, that's fine. Um, of course, things are a bit more difficult than this. So um, MTT bar, as I'll explain in the, literally the next slide, um, is actually not something that we have direct access to. We have to reconstruct our tops and this can be quite difficult. So, all you really need to know is that our MTT bar comes with some resolution, and that resolution isn't small. That resolution is on the order to 40 or 50 GeV. This is um, actually a pretty good resolution in terms of MTT to bar, um, considering it's made up of six different objects. But nevertheless, it's not like perfect. So we couldn't do a super strict cut on here, or we have to be very careful how we do it, and there are important experimental considerations to how you do this. So what we do in our measurement is we actually split our measurement into three different regions based on MTT bar cuts. So we have a signal region, which is a very, very tight, very narrow region here between 340 and 380 GeV. Um, and then we have a validation region, which is between 380 and 500 GeV. And then another validation region, which is just everything higher than 500 GeV. And the reason we do this is um, in this green region here, the signal region, we really want to be sensitive to entanglement, but we also want to be able to check that we're not introducing some kind of detector biases and things like this. This isn't necessarily the same biases we were talking about with the loopholes yesterday. This is just uh, general detector biases that we always try and control for in experimental measurements. Um, so we have a validation region here where we expect there's still going to be some moderate amount of uh, signal of entanglement, but probably we're not going to be able to detect it. Nevertheless, we're hoping the, like, the, 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 the tops, uh, the, the way the detector responds to the tops and any biases that might be in that would be similar to the signal region. And then we also have another validation region here, which is where we don't expect the tops to look similar at all. Um, and again, we want to be able to see what the bias looks like here. So in the perfect case, if you were to measure your bias, or which we usually call detector corrections, you would, it, it would look identical in all three of these regions and then you're, you're fine, right? Then you can say, okay, my detector doesn't care what the MTT bar was. It would have reconstructed it the same way regardless of the entanglement in the system. So that's the ideal case. It's you, almost never happens in any measurement that you want to do, but nevertheless, you can, if, you, if you can look at different regions, you can control for this and look at how it's changing with, uh, with the amount of entanglement. So why is it difficult to reconstruct top quarks in the first place? Um, I don't think we've seen a slide on this yet, so it's, I'll introduce it. Tops decay almost 100% of the time to um, a B quark and a W boson. 
um, to, to a first order approximation. Um, and then those W bosons decay either leptonically or hadronically. And as we heard yesterday, W bosons are really nice because they're their own polar limiters. Um, so uh, the, the spin analyzing power comes from, um, comes from either the charged lepton or the downtype quark, depending on which way the W decayed. Um, you can use either. Um, downtype quarks get slightly higher um, QCD corrections than, than leptons, obviously, but it's not a big problem. But the spin analyzing power of those particles is basically one. If you can measure their direction, you know what the spin of the tops was. Um, the problem is with, uh, with jets, it's very difficult to tag jet flavors to know if something was an up quark or a downtype quark. In fact, it's really not a well-defined problem. So we tend to try and avoid doing that most of the time. And uh, we use charged leptons as, instead. And charged leptons are really nice experimentally because these are the best and most efficient way to trigger um, the collisions that you're interested in in your detector. So there's re really good experimental motivations for taking leptonic W decays over hadronic ones. Um, and we classify TT bar decays based on how the W's decayed. So if we call it dilepton, we, we mean both W's decayed leptonically. If we call it single lepton or semi-leptonic, um, only one of them did. And if we call it all hadronic or all jets, um, then that's just both W's went hadronically. And this measurement only uses, um, yeah, this measurement only uses um, the dilepton decay mode. In fact, it only uses dilepton decay mode where one of the W's went um, electronically and the other one went mu muonically. And the reason for that is just that there's very few other processes in the standard model that can fake this, especially when you add the requirement that you also have two B-tagged jets as well. So it's a really useful way of suppressing almost all the background. I'm not going to talk about the background very much, because it, but I can tell you we can select the TT bar with almost 95% purity. So it's, uh, it's usually a very minor problem. The big problem comes from the neutrinos. So if we've taken, taken the dilepton decay mode, um, we're then not in, uh, we, we don't have any handle on what the four vectors and the neutrinos are. And we're going to need these because remember this D angle that we want to measure, or this D parameter we want to measure, needs to be measured in the parent top rest frame. So we need to be able to reconstruct the top so we can boost objects into that rest frame, in, boost the leptons in this case into that, into that rest frame. And the only handle we have on this really in Atlas is, and CMS and most detectors, is that um, we know how much missing transverse energy we have, but we, we lose all of the Z um, direction information. Anything along the beam line, we have no handle on how much missing energy went in that direction. So this is a problem, but it's not an intractable one, and we have a lot of experience in dealing with this. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because there's an entire talk on this, I think, on I don't know, Wednesday, Thursday. There's a, there's a talk on top reconstruction, so I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, all you need to know here is that um, we have to deal with these two neutrinos. And in this measurement, we've used a method called the ellipse method. It's an analytical method where you introduce some extra assumptions on the model. Uh, so you, as you assume some very mild standard model assumptions. So you assume what the top mass is and what the W mass is, which are very well experimentally measured. You also have to explicitly assume that the top decays to a B and a W and that the W decays to, uh, to leptons. Again, it's not a particularly d a strong assumption to make given how we've selected our events. And with these extra constraints, you can, you can introduce some tricks to basically solve for the missing, uh, missing degrees of freedom from the neutrinos. Again, I'm not going to go into too much detail for it. All you need to know is that that approach is analytical and it comes with some some non-trivial resolution, in particular in MTT bar that we care about. So I want to show you what the events look like after we selected them at the detector level. So what, literally what we get out of the detector. So this is um, in our signal region here. Oh, I've defined the signal regions again. I forgot. OK. This is the signal region. Um, and this is the cosine phi. Uh, um, so we have the data points in black. And then we have um, different Monte Carlo predictions. So they're all with Powhag. Um, with either different showers or a different underlying Powhag model. So we have Powhag plus Pythia, Powhag plus Herwig, um, and then Powhag plus Pythia, but with the BB4L model. Um, I'm sure someone's going to ask me questions about BB4L, so I'm not going to talk about it in too much detail. This is, in theory, a, a, a more precise prediction than, than these two, but it also comes with some caveats that means that it's a bit difficult for us to use. Um, if people want to ask me about that, they can do. But um, and anyway, so what you can see is um, on the left, the cosine phi distribution, and you see the data agrees reasonably well within the Monte Carlo, with, the, um, with the Monte Carlo predictions. The background here, as I said, is very, very small. It's actually higher here than it normally is because we've, even, no one probably cares about this too much, but we've uh, used a rather loose um, working point in our B tagging. So we picked a, a way of tagging out the flavor of our jets that's very efficient, but also suffers from a slightly higher fake rate. Um, and that's to try and keep um, as much statistics as we can in the measurement because we know already that we're going to have to cut quite tight on MTT bar, so we want to make sure we have enough events in our signal region. So this is looser than we would typically go in a top analysis, but even with a very loose B-tagging requirement, we have very little background, so that's quite nice. 
And in the top right here, we have what the D parameter looks like uh, at Rico level. So you can already see that the data is slightly uh, lower than we expect from the Monte Carlos. Um, and the uncertainty on the Monte Carlos is shown here in the ratio. Um, oh, sorry, the uncertainty on the prediction yet is here in the ratio, and that's this gray band here. Um, and this is, uh, this is showing both the normalization and the shape uncertainty, and this is mostly coming from scale variations. Um, but if you, took, if you take those out, the actual uncertainties are smaller, but still agreeing with all the different Monte Carlos. And this is exactly what you see in almost all top measurements at this point. Um, this is also what it looks like in the validation regions, so validation region one and validation region two. And here you can again can see that things don't look too bad. There's some slight normalization shifts. Interestingly enough, in this measurement, we don't care at all about normalization, really, because we're only measuring the mean of a distribution. So if there's some slight normalization offset, it doesn't matter. And that's going to be very good for us later, because things that can have rather large effects on normalization, like scale uncertainty in Monte Carlo, aren't going to matter very much in the end for the measurement, which is, is nice. Right, so um, it's all very well and good to look at things at reconstructed level, but we, want to, we know that this D parameter has to be less than minus a third for us to unambiguously say that we've seen entanglement, and our detector is distorting that. We have big detector effects from the TT bar reconstruction, smaller ones from the various object reconstructions, so we want to be able to correct for these effects so we can compare directly to this number. There are many, many ways of doing this. In fact, it's fair to say that in most standard model measurements, not searches, but in measurements, this is what we spend most of our time doing, and it's correcting for the effects of the detector. We normally do things that are a bit more complicated, so you, if you've been to any experimental talk before, you might have heard about things like unfolding or things like more complicated profile likelihood fits. Here we've gone back to doing something very, very simple, and that's just a, a very basic calibration curve. And the reason we've done this is, again, driven by the resolution in MTTT bar. Um, all these more complicated methods we would normally use require you to have very good resolution or to not be binning anywhere close to your resolution in whatever distribution you're trying to correct. Um, and we can't do that here, so we have to do something simpler. So all we're, really, <clears throat> all we're really doing is taking a calibration curve where we look at the reconstructed value of D um, versus the predicted value of D in our Monte Carlo, and we construct um, some correction curve like this. And we create, to build this, we have to create some different hypothesis points. Um, so we have a standard model assumption here. So this is standard model quantum entanglement. To be able to do this method, you have to be able to change quantum entanglement in the Monte Carlo. And this is difficult, to say the very least. Um, there's no tunable parameter in Monte Carlo that changes quantum entanglement. It's fundamental to the calculation. So it's a really fair question to ask, well, how have we possibly changed it in a way that's sensible? So we've had to take an experimentalist approach to this. Um, so you could try and do something very complicated with reweighting initial spin states, but the, we don't really have the information to do this in the Monte Carlo. So what we've done is instead try to deal, from this, deal with this from an observable point of view. So what we've done is we've reweighted the, this, this D. So the D is basically just the slope of this cosine phi distribution. So we've reweighted this slope as a function of MTT bar. So what this is basically doing is saying, what would entanglement look like if, if it were different in these two observables? And we think this is a pretty good approximation of that. The limitation of this is that although we think this works for the two observables we really care about, so the MTT bar that we're strongly cutting on and the observable we're using to measure it, there's no guarantee that this propagates perfectly to something like the lepton PT that we also have to cut on to select events or the pseudo rapidity of the jets that we also have to cut on because our detector has some acceptance. So this is, a, this is a limiting assumption in the measurement. There's no way getting around it, but we think it's a pretty reasonable one and that it's not, I mean, we have systematic uncertainties obviously, but we think it's one that doesn't overall impact the sensitivity. But nevertheless, it is an assumption we had to make to be able to do the measurement in the first place. If someone wants to come up with a really clever way of changing entanglement in a formally correct way in Monte Carlos, we would all be really grateful for that. But I think you would probably see that the effect on the cosine phi and the effect on MTT bar would look the same. So systematic uncertainties, um, this is super important in, in this measurement and in others, but especially in this measurement. So this calibration curve is very simple and it also is quite robust to um, systematic uncertainties on the detector correction. So this is what our normal calibration curve looks like. We have some RICO level and some truth level in our points, and this is our calibration curve. Now, ideally what you want is when you shift a systematic uncertainty, that you shift everything in a correlated way. So let's, there's, there is one systematic that does almost exactly this, and it's um, a particular setting in PowerHeg called HDAMP. This sort of controls the cutoff of the first emission in PowerHeg. Um, and when you change that value, the, the value of that cutoff, what you see is um, the truth value shifts by some amount, but the RICO value shifts in some exactly correlated way, and you end up building exactly the same calibration curve as you would have before. And therefore, you have no systematic uncertainty, right? If you unfolded the, the RICO level observed data with this calibration curve, you'd get exactly the same answer with this one, even though you built it with different points. So in that case, in this perfect case, um, you wouldn't have any systematic uncertainty at all. Um, and one or two of our uncertainties do behave this way, but unfortunately, not all of them. 
So this is the, this is the ideal case. What you tend to see happening more is that um, the truth information doesn't shift with the systematic bias, but um, the RICO information does. So all of our detector uncertainties do this. If we change how we reconstructed the leptons, if we change the, the uncertainties on how we triggered, um, any of the corrections we apply that shift RICO level, they don't shift anything in, implicit in Powhegg or something like this. So we end up with a slightly different slope in our systematic uncertainty, uh, in, in our calibration curve. And then the difference between these two points, uh, between these two curves is our systematic uncertainty. So another interesting feature you can see is that the systematic uncertainty is not linear with with the RICO value. So our systematic uncertainty will shift depending on what we actually measure in the detector. So in this cartoon, right, if you measured it here, the uncertainty would be, if the D happens to be here, it would be very small. If you're unlucky and the D, the D value observed was down here, you get a much larger uncertainty. So in the paper, we actually quote from numerous points what the uncertainty is so you can get a feel for this. Um, the worst case of a systematic uncertainty behaving really badly is when um, it shifts the RICO and the truth in a non-correlative way and you get a different slope and a different offset um, and pretty much all of our dominant uncertainties behave this way, unsurprisingly. Um, but nevertheless, this is, this is sort of effect you get. You still see this, uh, this behavior that the, that the uncertainty is not linear, but um, it's a much bigger effect if you have this kind of thing happening. So in summary, this is what our systematic uncertainties look like. So we have the standard model expectation. So the, uh, sorry, the standard model expectation here. So this is the D if we measured exactly as the standard model predicts, the standard model in this case being the power egg plus Pythia 8 model. And that's a D value of about minus 0 0.47. Um, and then this is what it looks like with the actual observed one, which uh, there's a slight hint there that we see something different from what we expected. So uh, we actually observe a D of minus 0 0.547. Um, and so we, the system of concerns are very slightly different. But what you actually see is the numbers are not hugely dis, uh, different between the, between the two uh, points. So it's, it's fine. Um, and unsurprisingly, our biggest uncertainties come from the signal modeling. Um, this has been true for almost all of run two and half of run one for, for top analyses. We have very, very, very good control of our detector uncertainties in top measurements. And so our uncertainties that come from the Monte Carlo modeling and the signal modeling, these tend to be much bigger for us or rel relatively bigger. I mean, it's still an uncertain, total uncertainty of less than 5%. And the, um, so this is, this is still pretty good. <laughs> Um, on, by experimental standards, but nevertheless, it's, uh, the, it's definitely fair to say we have a large uncertainty from signal modeling. We also have a slightly higher uncertainty than normal from background, but I can talk about that if people are interested. So on these signal modeling uncertainties, um, let it never be said that Atlas shies away from adding every possible variation we can think of to our Monte Carlo models. So we have a lot of uncertainties here. We have uncertainties related to top quark decay, to PDFs, to the color recoil scheme in Pythia. This is the new one, um, which is hopefully gonna go away soon when we start doing it properly. Um, final state radiation, um, scale uncertainties in the, in the matrix element. And we also have the, an effect for what higher orders in the QCD prediction for the matrix element might look like. Um, various Monte Carlo settings, PT hard is another Pythia, uh, power related setting. Uh, uncertainty on the top quark, top quark mass, and okay, this H damp parameter that I told you about, this is the one that behaves almost perfectly. You see it's a really small effect. Um, we also have some other things that we checked, but we don't include um, because they didn't really matter, um, and they were so small it wasn't worth including them. So things like color reconnection, um, things like this can actually be very big for things like top mass analysis, so it's worth checking them. Uh, string versus cluster fragmentation, we checked explicitly, this didn't have a big effect. Spin correlations in the parton shower, which you get a bit nervous about because it has the word spin correlation in it, but these don't matter either. Um, the electroweak behavior that's weak parts of the shower, all of these were tested and found to be pretty negligible. So they're not, they don't appear in our list. Okay, so the results, um, you've, I'm, we saw this plot like three times yesterday, so you've probably seen it. Here are the numbers if you're that bothered, but what you really wanna see here is the behavior of the three different regions. So we have the signal region where we, ex where we, expect, what, what we expect to find entanglement. So that's this expectation is this red point here. Um, and the entanglement limits, I'll talk about why they're different uh, here on the y-axis. So you can see we're really far below with that. So already just by eye, you might think, okay, this is pretty strong. Um, and then in our validation region, the first one where we expect to have some effects of entanglement, but our resolution is probably making it not observable for us. You see exactly that. Um, so um, we didn't, it's worth pointing out, we didn't, we didn't know these numbers when we set these uh, regions. So it's quite nice that they behave the way we expected. Um, and then, okay, in the region where you don't expect to see any entanglement, you, you, know, you don't see any at all. You're far above these lines. It's also worth pointing out that none of these values are zero, so there's still spin correlation everywhere. There's spin correlation across this entire MTT bar range as we expect, because we've observed this many times. So there's no point where, the, where there's no spin correlation at all, but there are, point, there are points where, the, where that spin correlation cannot be described by purely classical probabilities. Um, so um, I think we heard yesterday, what was it, a solid state measurement that had a significance of 220 sigma. 
I'd very much like to know how many toy experiments they ran to get um, to be sure that they really did have 220 sigma. Um, we don't have the lifetime of the universe to run toys, so all we do here is confirm that we are above five sigma significance. If you want to count the standard deviations yourself, you can count it's about 10, but I mean, this, even this is too many to be running that many toy experiments. So all we did is basically really, we're very, very sure that we're above five sigma significance, so this is, this is why we don't put an exact number on it. Um, so these are common questions that we've had since the result and also during Atlas review. So I think it's probably worth going through them because I, I mean, I, some people in this room have asked me these questions, so it's probably worth talking about them. And so how reliable are each of the elements of this result? So the data points is what I spoke most about. This is with the systematic uncertainties. Um, so the corrections to the data, at least Atlas's message on this, is that these are very reliable. Um, we have a comprehensive and conservative, and that's conservative even by Atlas's standards, uh, list of systematic uncertainties, and it can be considered on all, all aspects of, this, of the analysis. There are some specific ones that we talked about recently um, in various other workshops and conferences that I'll get to in a minute, particularly on the balanced state effects that we also uh, touched on yesterday. Um, but all in all, the message is that you know, we're, pretty, we're pretty confident that these numbers are, are good and that the error bars on them are also pretty good. Uh, the predictions for standard model, I think it's fair to say that these are reliable, but you shouldn't ignore the limitations of what they are. These, these models are extremely successful general purpose Monte Carlo models that can describe any observable you can think of in any phase space to within some reasonable approximation at the LEC, and that's, that shouldn't be understated. We're looking in a very, very small region of phase space where very subtle effects that shouldn't matter at all for most of the phase space um, do matter here. So there is a limit to how well these, these models are going to describe it. And there aren't any better models we could stick on there that would do a better job. So um, you although you can see that the data is not agreeing with the standard model predictions particularly well, um, you shouldn't make too much of a deal out of that and then think immediately it's new physics. Where's Juan Antonio? There he is. Juan Antonio did a talk on how this is three sigma and what new physics that could be. And while that might be true, that's not the statement we're making, Juan Antonio. <laughs> so... Nobody else start putting error bars on, on this here, right? Um, so we understand them very well, but they're not designed to model this region properly. I'll talk a bit more about that towards the end. Um, right, so why do we have two different limits here? Um, um, we said, uh, I said early on that the, 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 this condition for entanglement is minus a third, right? So why is, why is there two different numbers? In particular, why does one of them have an error bar? So we can't, uh, for, for basically due to the fact that the, the showers, the parton showers introduce a, a big difference here, and I'm going to show you a plot of that. Um, we couldn't do the measurement to, to parton levels. The parton level is what experiments are used to try and approximate what the pure calculations are. It isn't actually true, but it's about as close as we can get. Um, people sometimes forget that, but it, it, it's about as close as we can get. There's another way we can do truth measurements, and that's where we only build objects using stable particles in the Monte Carlo. So we allow the tops to decay, we allow leptons to, to radiate, and all kinds of other things, and we end up with a list of stable particles. These particles haven't interacted with the detector in any way. It's just a collection of pions and photons and electrons and muons and things like this. And what we do is we simply apply the same um, object reconstruction algorithms that we do to our Rico level objects um, to these truth level objects. And it's called stable particle level for this reason. Um, and in this case, sometimes it can be quite different from the, from the parton level. In this case, that's not exactly um, true. So this is, the, this is the prediction for power plus pithy rate at particle level um, for the d of minus a third. And the way we've done that is we've basically done a calibration curve again from the parton level to the particle level. I can show you a picture of it if, you, if you're interested, but just trust me that it's a, it's a very trivial and simple correction to get from parton level to particle level. And with the power plus pythia, you get basically exactly, you stay at a third. The correction is basically one. It's actually minus 0 0.3 two five or something like this. It's, it's, it, you, you, it's very little difference between what parson level and particle level give you here. That isn't the case with power plus Herwig where you see that the, the D value gets quite low. It's diluted to some, to some extent. And in fact, you see this across all, if you look at the spin density matrix parameters that I haven't shown you, but you can trust me that we know how to build them and look at them. You see that the, 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 the Herwig shower is for some reason diluting the spin correlation. Now we don't know whether that's correct or not correct, um, but we know it's, that's what's happening and that's the difference between the two. So we have two limits here because we're not sure, we have no reason to know which one is correct or not. Um, the, the nice thing is it doesn't really matter which limit we took. It also doesn't matter which um, version of the standard model we decide. Um, if we, pick, if we, we picked Pythia, and that's the one that's closest to the data. If we were to swap to Herwig or take this Herwig limit instead, it just makes the result more significant. So we're not particularly worried about our statement about having observed entanglement. If we swap the, these, these around or picked one uh, d generator over the other, then you know, um, we would just have a more significant result. So it doesn't really matter. Nevertheless, it is a really interesting difference. Um, 
This has come up a while, as well a lot. So um, uh, when I said the Monte Carlo's are limited, they don't include very subtle bound state effects. So toponium is a really good example of this. So you can see this is the MTT bar spectrum. Um, and a cross section is a function of MTT bar. And you can see that at very, very low values of MTT bar, you get some slight bound state effects that we call toponium. Probably doesn't really behave like a top meson, but it's a nice name for it. Um, and you get some small enhancement in the cross section. So here, here it's split into the different um, spin states and initial states. So you only see it in the glow and glow infusion and only in the spin singlet state. This is just the inclusion, this is all the, this is the total cross section, so everything's summed together. So, these, these effects are not included in Monte Carlo simulations, and they happen right in the region where, we're, where we expect entanglement to be. Um, so it's a fair question to ask, how do we deal with this, or should we be worried about it? Um, so the effect of this is, if you add toponium in here, it increases the amount of entanglement that you expect to see. And we're quite sure of this. It do doesn't decrease the entanglement, so that's one thing. So again, we're not expecting it should take us in the wrong direction, away from entanglement. Um, what we've done is, um, oh, I've missed a slide. Um, okay, so what we've done, one test we've done, for example, is to um, try and reweight our cross-section to introduce this bump and see if it has a big effect. It, it, it turns out it doesn't actually have that much of an effect. It's, it's a noticeable one, but it's on the same order of, uncer of uncertainty as uh, the top mass uncertainty we take, which is half a GV. Um, so you imagine the top mass that shifts everything to the left a little bit because you lower the mass. Um, um, and that has, uh, but we don't change the, the mass cut, the MTT bar cuts when we do this. So we end up with more events in our signal region. So that effect um, is almost the same order of magnitude. We even have bigger effects that affect this entire top line shape here, um, for better or worse. Um, it's actually a very conservative uncertainty that not all analyses use um, because it's arguably too big. But we do include it here. It's our dominant uncertainty, and it changes exactly this line shape at exactly the point where you expect toponium to occur. So you get an, enha an enhancement. Um, so. Even if we're missing toponium, this is why we're quite confident that our systematic model already covers this effect for better or worse. We, you also have to remember that we don't have the experimental resolution to see this bump, right? Our experimental resolution is on the order of 40 GeV. So in effect, from the measurement point of view, all you're doing is slightly increasing the cross-section or decreasing it. You're not adding the bump here doesn't make that much of a difference. So how that would look on our plot is um, if we included these in, in the predictions, it would probably mean the predictions would move closer to the data. It would increase the amount of entanglement. We don't know by how much. Um, it would be nice. I, I very much doubt it will be too long before someone figures out a way to do this. But um, it would shift the, uh, the predictions closer to the data. Um, how far that goes, we don't know. Um, as for the error bars, I've, I've exaggerated it here. It might change the error bars a little bit. But the, as far as we know at the moment, the effect, as well as we can estimate it with this very hacky sort of reweighting test, um, is small enough that you actually wouldn't see a change in the error bar size at all. It certainly wouldn't change the significance, um, and it would only be in this direction. So we're not worried about this one. What we are worried about, not because it affects the measurement, but because we don't understand where it comes from at all, is the difference you see in this prediction between Herwig and Pythia in the plots, so this red point and the blue point. This appears to be coming from the type of ordering you do in the shower. Now, we spent, I kid you not, about a year trying to figure out what was going on here. Because at, at first, we just changed the shower and saw a massive effect, and we didn't know what it was. So we checked all kinds of things, spin correlations in the showers, cluster versus string fragmentation, the classic one. And we ended up narrowing it down to what we think is caused by the dipole shower versus the angular ordered shower. And, that, and quite nicely, you can, you can flip in Herwig which type of ordering your shower uses, and then you see almost exactly the same effect as you do from comparing Pythia to Herwig just out of the box. So by default, Herwig is using an angular ordered shower, and uh, Pythia is using a dipole shower. So it, this, this uncertainty, the difference between these, is included in our detector um, related, uh, is included in the measurement as a systematic uncertainty. So it's not like, it's not like this point, it, oh. this point is including that difference. It's a smaller difference on this point because as I said, I was explained with this, with this calibration curve, just because the difference in models is large doesn't mean the effect on the detector corrections is large. It actually behaves quite well. The part and shower is a rather small uncertainty. But it affects the predictions by quite a lot, and this is really surprising. Um, we, we don't know any more beyond this point. It's, the Herberg authors know about it. The Pythia authors know about it. We're talking to them a lot. But it's still not very clear why this is an effect at all. So conclusions, um, so we've observed quantum entanglement for the first time in a pair of fundamental quarks at the highest lab major energies, that's the PR line. Um, more importantly, I think you see this from the number of papers that have been coming on and the fact that we've had workshops like this and that people are talking so much at these workshops, that the LHC is hopefully, we're hopefully starting to explore how we could use this as a tool for exploring quantum information. This is the first measurement. I'm not going to talk about future measurements because I think Andy's going to talk about that on Thursday or Friday, but I, there are definitely plenty of measurements going on in both Atlas and CMS on this now, doing all kinds of different things with quantum information. This is just the first one. Um, 
And it's raised really important questions, for example, about um, how entanglement is modeled in the threshold region and spin correlation by extension, um, and things like how to change entanglement in the Monte Carlo in a sensible way, all these kind of things. And I think this is, well, I've already asked some of you questions yesterday on this, but I think this is something that's a really nice topic for discussion here at this workshop. Thank you a lot, Jay. We open the floor for questions. Very much. Great, brilliant. Yeah, you, you are also in the, the slide that I want to talk. I just want to understand a bit better this uh, money plot that you have. Okay, so first of all, when you quote the, the, how many sigmas you see, from which line do you use the, the dash or the dash with the error the, bar? The dash one. With the, with the, error, uh, with the error bar. With the one without, without the error bar? Oh, I, sh I just forgot to say, sorry, there's a reason there's no error bar on this one, um, and that's because this theory uncertainty here, normally we would just have scale and PDF uncertainties on a prediction. Um, to be conservative, um, this is actually including every single modeling uncertainty that we have on the Pythia generator, and it's already quite small. The reason we don't put a scale and PDF uncertainty on the Herwig line after doing that is because it would, make, it would give the impression that the, that the Herwig prediction is somehow more precise than the Pythia one, and that's because we just don't have this kind of handle on all the uncertainties in Herwig, we use Pythia more often, so we left it off politically. It, it, you shouldn't read from this that Herwig is perfect and Pythia is uncertain. It's just a case that we don't have a good estimate on the Herwig error compared to the Pythia one. I know that wasn't your question, but I realized I forgot to say it. Right, good. The, the other thing, so the toponymal effects, you expect that it will be not much larger than this theory error? Because that's not really accounted for. You try to mimic? So, I mean, I mean on, on the measurement, Where's my systematics list? So on the measurement, it's, it ends up round about here in the uncertainty rankings. So it's not tiny, it's definitely a big effect, but this uncertainty does something similar, at least from the experimental point of view, because of our resolution. This thing does something similar, this thing does something similar in a much more dramatic way, arguably not even in a correct way, but it's in there. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very large effect, and we're hoping we can do a lot more studies and get this down in the future. But uh, with our very hand, the, the ca calculation I showed you is a 14 TV one. We don't have a 13 TV calculation for this, so even that reweighting is already a bit odd. Um, but it ends up round about somewhere here. Interestingly enough, even if we'd underestimated it by a factor of four, it wouldn't, it would have to be, I think I worked it out last night, it has to be five or six times larger for, to start to affect the five sigma statement. Okay. Final one. Can you go back to your money plot again? You can tell I've been asked many questions about this. <laughs> It's a, it's a perfectly reasonable question to ask. Yeah. So the, the, the other thing that is curious about this plot is that uh, you have these three regions that you analyze. Mm -hmm. So the, the only one that differs is the, the one that you, you want to define your signal region, yeah. right? Why, why you don't see much of a difference on the other regions? So I think this is related to where is this difference coming from with uh, Pythia and Herwig. I think I mean, we don't know yet. So my guess would be that something is happening with the spin correlations, and the spin correlations, especially with the like listed gluons, are, de are dominant at low MTT bar. So the, basically you're asking what changes in these showers with MTT bar. I, I'd be lying if I say I know, the, I know the answer. We do know that the spin correlation changes more here than it does up here. Why that is the case, I, we, we just don't know. I don't have a good answer. But the Herwig authors don't have a good answer either, so yet, so I think it's fair. So just for fun, since you also have another region that has been correlations, a high PT, mm -hmm. you can check. I mean, not the measurement, but the two Monte Carlo to see. Well, you see it here, right? No, no. The other region where you have entanglement. Oh, you mean the QQ bar and the boosted? Yeah. Uh, we could. Th there are bigger experimental problems there. Uh, like, like I said, it involves no, using... No, okay, but just to compare the Monte Carlo. Oh, yeah, sure. But Okay, fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but five they, are, they, they are correlated. So, yeah. But also, okay, fine. I mean, this this is this one analysis. It, there's a whole suite of run two measurements. There's plenty of boosted ones that show similar, if not exactly the same, observables that can be that could be sensitive to the same effects, right? And there's it's not there's, there's not a clear picture here. It's not that Powig, uh, that Pythia and Herwig always have this relative difference. There's plenty of uh, regions of phase space where Herwig agrees much better with the data than Pythia does, for example. It's, it's, not, it, it's not a clear cut, easy statement. I think it's more subtle than that. I mean, you're right that we could, we could, we could just select a truth level, make a rivet routine and just check, but. Oh. Oh, 
Oh, here we go. It's Juan Antonio. <laughs> Sorry, I always complain about uh, your measurements. <laughs> Uh, first, one, one thing, I don't know if, uh, I did not uh, understand very well Dorival's question, but maybe it wasn't mine. You have an entanglement below 500 GV, mm -hmm. so she, these points should be below minus 0 0.3, right? Yeah, so the problem here is that, although we do have entanglement below 500 GV, the events that go into this, both into the prediction, because this is the prediction corrected for detector effects as well. So it, uh, the events that go into this are not strictly below 500 GV if you look at where they really came from. So at, at RICO level, yeah, we, we tell them to be low, on, low than 500 GV, but there will be plenty of events that were misreconstructed that actually had an MTT bar of, say, 600 GV that enter, enter that signal region. So you end up with a dilution effect, and that's why you sort of end up on the edge here. So you should have the same also in the, in the beam where you measure it? Yeah, well, the, I mean, exactly. The, 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 there is a dilution effect here as well. The, the, the reason we go so tight is that we want to be able to, set, to be sensitive despite that resolution effect. That's why we have to be so careful and why we had to use a calibration curve and not some other fancier method. But okay. yeah, the, 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 the resolution affects all the bins in the same way. There are, there are events that should be in this signal region that are up here. There are events that should be in this region that are down here. That's very true. Okay, one last question and the rest are tomorrow, okay? <laughs> I'm not completely sure that uh, you can claim uh, that uh, you have a thin entanglement. Why? Because, I mean, the, the theoretical criterion is that D is smaller than minus one third, okay? Mm -hmm. But uh, you are cooking data here because you are at the particle level. So in some sense, it is not at the theoretical D, right? Okay, two points on that. One, even parton level is not a theoretical D, right? This is the parton level is not exactly what a fixed order calculation gives you. It is us looking into the Monte Carlo history and doing our best approximation of that. And there are cases where this breaks down. I don't think this is one of those cases, but there are places where that doesn't work. Um, if I were to re remake this plot at parton level, which the original version of the plot looked like, um, what you would see is basically the same thing, it, almost exactly the same thing actually, except this line isn't here and this minus a third isn't here, and you end up with a massive uncertainty that just goes in this direction, uh, sorry, massive uncertainty that just goes in this direction, that way, the wrong way. Because like I said, the Herwig makes you more significant, not less. So it's just, you end up with a very asymmetric error bar that looks ugly, and also is arguably less controlled. So we, we, we do it to particle level because we really, we really safely control particle level. We know exactly what it is. We don't think that, we, we, we don't think that this extrapolation is degrading our sensitivity, but we, it, it, it is obviously doing something different, and this is a, a nicer way of showing it. Because otherwise it's kind of hidden, right? The fact that these, that these predictions, the differences between parton and particle level, if we correct everything to parton level exactly, you end up with some big error bar here, but you're not sure if that's coming from the detector corrections or if it's coming from the changes in the prediction. So here you see both effects pretty well. Okay, we can discuss later. Yeah. Is this a follow-up on, on this? Yeah. <laughs> so my, my question is, is directly related to this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, you did a, a very nice piece of work, and I, I'm totally convinced that uh, this is entanglement. I'm part of the authorship, but of the author list, but <laughs> I did not. Uh, you did the job. Uh, so my question is the following: At the end, this is the discovery phase, and this, this procedure is totally fine. Okay, mm -hmm. yep. but at the end. Uh, when we will move to the measurement phase, uh, we need to reconstruct the C, uh, the, speed, the correlation matrix uh, elements, okay? So we have to unfold uh, at the end. So my question is, uh, can you explain to us which are exactly the, uh, the problems that you found during the unfolding? Yeah, I, I can actually. Um, I don't have a plot next to a public version. So the problem, the, the limitation of unfolding is that you, you basically, for people, I hope everyone is vaguely familiar with unfolding, but if, if essentially you're building a matrix that looks, that um, describes your detector correction or your detector smearing and you're inverting it in some way. And you have to somehow control that inversion to not get large errors. But that's basically what you're doing. This only works very well when that matrix is quite diagonal or is, if, if there is significant smearing in it, that that smearing is also quite diagonal. Um, the problem we have is that because the resolution, because the signal region we need to extract here is so narrow, the resolution we had was not, it was quite smeared, and therefore when you do the unfolding you find yourself very sensitive to small differences in what the standard model prediction was. So you can unfold it, it's fine, you can always unfold something. The point is the region of valid validity for that unfolding was so narrow that we thought it probably isn't very useful. Ideally what you want is, like the quest classic question is, 
is your unfolding sensitive to new physics, right? Because you've unfolded some distribution, then you want to put some new physics curve on it. Would your detector have responded to the new physics model the same way as the standard model? Most of the times we try and describe some wide area of validity to make sure that that's usually true for anything people want. Here we couldn't do that. What you end up seeing is you end up, if you slightly change the slope of the D angle, for example, so you change entanglement by like 5% or whatever, you see significant non-closure of this effect. And then, we're, so it's kind of like, unless you see exactly the standard model, what you expected to see, you're not really going to be sure with unfolding that you've done a good job in this specific case. So that's why we dropped it. Yeah, but you agree with me that at the very end, the physics is uh, uh, does not depend on all the statistics models that you the, oh, sure. the I mean, tools that you use. No? So at the end, you should find exactly the same result. The, 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 yeah. Um, the, ne the, the next job we will, have, will be doing is entirely, it is going to be entirely focused on trying to improve this. So it's mostly coming from the TT bar reconstruction. And that is something that as experimentalists we can try and improve. There's loads of people, every like postdoc around right now in top is like throwing, throwing machine learning at this problem and trying to fix it. So. Two questions. One, a uh, very quick one. When you showed the cos phi distribution, there was a third Monte Carlo prediction from PowerHack with a new model. Yep. Why is that not in your result plot? Excellent question. Um, so, B before L. Right, so this measurement is a TT bar measurement. Um, these predictions, PowerHack plus Pythia and PowerHack plus Herwig, these ones are doing TT bar to dial-ups on in this case. Um, B before L is a better prediction because it's doing the full PP to B, B, L, L, new, new, final state, including off-shell effects and not including the narrow-width approximation or anything like this. So that you don't, this, in these two, the, the, the production and decay are factorized. That's not the case in B before L. So it's not TT bar. In fact, to first order, it's TT bar plus single top production. So it's TT bar plus WT. Um, to put, so we can put it on a Rico level plot like this because when we stack our backgrounds, we just don't add the single top in and we just use BB4L as, as it is. When you're doing detector corrections, you have, to you have to define your truth here and that has to be defined based on TT bar. So with BB4L, the way you can do this is, well, if you want to do this, you have to first somehow require that both tops are on shell, which we can do with Monte Carlo history. It's not too bad. But then you also have to account for the fact that you're gonna, you need to subtract the single top contribution, which is very small, but it's still there. And you have to choose how you do this, either with a diagram subtraction technique or diagram removal technique, and that becomes some uncertainty on it. And essentially, when you do this, what you find is you've destroyed the, pre the precision of the prediction you wanted to include. So we could have done this. In fact, the very first version of this plot did have B before L on it. I, I'm not going to tell you where it was, but if you look at the Rico level plot, you can kind of guess. The, the reason is you end up adding so many, the legend gets like this wide. You add so many caveats on it, and you destroy the prediction so much that you argue, like, why am I even bothering doing this? I've introduced so many caveats that it's, it just leaves the prediction not on par with either of these, which is weird because it's a, it's a more precise prediction. So that's, it's more of a political reason for taking it off than, than an actual... Right. Physics region. Right. It should be better, but the, the way we have to set up the measurement kind of makes it not usable. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then the other question, as an experimentalist, I'm kind of unhappy with the fact that you don't observe the actually entanglement before you apply your calibration. The, the fact that the calibration is ah, so right. large. Uh, why is it so large and did you try to understand, like break it down into individual components like resolution on the TT rest frame? Uh, yeah, so it, basically when you look at it at a Rico level, you're bound to take, you have to take the full difference between the, the various models, right? You can't not take it. So um, this trick, I mean, this is the reason you want to do unfolding or detect corrections in the first place. It usually allows you to minimize some of the, some of the uncertainties in this way because you're not asking what is the full difference between this systematic model and this systematic model. You're just asking how did it affect my detector corrections. So, this is true in almost, if you look at any measurement that's done unfolding, this situation is always true, right? The uncertainties at RICO level are always bigger than they are at the unfolded level unless you're in a really, really poor region of phase space and your unfolding was really bad. Um, and, and it usually affects the modeling uncertainties more than anything else. So like, for example, Powig plus Hoig does shift the cosine phi and it does shift D. It gives you a different D parameter, right? And you're bound to take the difference between power equals pythia with our nominal h damp setting and our power equals pythia with some shifted h damp setting. You have to add that in quadrature here. You, after you've done detect corrections, it's not a problem because you get the same calibration curve from those two models. So this entire uncertainty basically vanishes when you do the detector correction. So I agree it's not as nice that you don't see at RICO level some nice significant difference from the expect, uh, from, from, uh, from minus a third, but it's kind of bound to happen. The, the actual effect of this dilution effect being, I think it's about a factor of three in the end, um, if you look at the calibration curve. Um, 
I would argue that's not the biggest correction. Um, we have plenty of measurements where the corrections are on order of power of 10 um, for extrapolations to full phase space and stuff like this. So it's, it's not the nicest. Um, it would be nice if this was one. Um, but given the cuts we have to apply to everything, I don't think we'd ever end up in this situation. So I, I agree it's not very nice, but there's not, nothing we can do about it, and we think we have a good control over it. Does that, I, I'm not sure if I got both, uh, did I get your question with both parts of that? Maybe it's a better yeah, show the calibration There's like no curve. single effect that kind of drives this uh, correction to be so large that you could kind of improve oh. upon the analysis. In yeah, the, uh, uh, the MTT bar the resolution, exactly this. It's, it's almost entirely the MTT bar resolution again. This, this is the single b best thing we could do to improve the measurement yeah. by a long way. Okay. That and understand the shower difference. Right, but but tough, right? yeah, okay. improving the top reconstruction is going to be the biggest thing that yeah, will change okay. this. Thank you. difference between the Rico D and the like particle D. So if you can go to the Rico It's that slope, right? That's the question you're asking about, the strength of yeah, that yeah, slope. Yeah, but the thing is, that if you go to the plot, th this one, so you can see that in the right part, well, if you know, if you look at the pattern level D, for example, this should be linear. So in the right part, you have some kind of a decrease, and this is coming from uh, overlap between both of the leptons with high cosinus phi, and therefore they're closer to each other, and some are removed. I mean, this is the experimental reason why we see this uh, factor of three difference. We take one last question, maybe two. Yeah, thank you a lot. Um, so first of all, I had a question on the first plot that you showed the uh, guesses from your, from your paper. This one, so why, why these uh, two lines are not exactly the same? That's a great question for Juan, who made the plot. <laughs> this, is the, this is from the Fino paper. Mm -hmm. All you have can answer, I don't know. But. Yeah. Yeah, this I can read, but uh, I want to know, I mean, I want to know they're not the same. I mean, would you expect them to be exactly the same? Yeah, I mean, if they are the same, they should be the same. I mean, if uh, the same elements go into a calculation, uh, un unless uh, there are uh, differences. Uh, what are the differences? Okay. I think it would be nice to, to know, I mean, this should be exactly the same. We did, we did it, to be honest, we didn't do like uh, a... Tuned. Uh, we just saw that it has the same okay. behavior. Okay. So uh, then the other, so I have a question on this plot that you're showing before, unfortunately. I can, so this uh, three region plot with the feature. E that one? No, the, um, go forward. Yeah, yeah. So, yep. so if I read this plot well, uh, it seems that the Monte Carlo here is getting the rate exactly very good, but not, I mean, the shape and the rate, let's say, the differential rate very well, but not uh, the correlation very well. I mean, there is some kind of tension in the, in the, in the, okay, in the parameter D. Mm -hmm. But the shape there is, is, is very good. So. We had debates on this. I'm annoyed because I knew this was going to happen if we set these uh, ratios here. So um, th this looks like the shape is fine, right? Uh, but this is a very broad range, like 20 plus or minus 20%. If I zoom in um, to the plus or minus 5% and I take out all these normalization uncertainties that are making this band big and not being particularly helpful, you see that the, 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 it, there is deviation up here, but the difference in D is driven by the bins here. Um, I can show you later a zoomed in version if you really want no, to see no, it. That was one but but there, there is significant differences down here, and that's what's drive, this is where all the stats are, and that drives this difference here that you see. But it's okay, it's not, it's not huge, but like, you, the agreement isn't what I would say perfect. The shape is not perfect. The rate is pretty good, but the shape is, is not perfect. If I were to do, I mean, also you don't see the correlation between the bins here, right? So, but in the, ne in, the next, uh, in the next slide, uh, the situation in here is opposite. Yeah, no, I mean, here it's uh, fine. If, if I look at the black dots, and they, they don't yeah. go on the, over the curve at all. Yeah. But uh, in the end, the D agree very well. Yeah. But I mean, so you have to remember, th this D is a spin correlation, right? Um, and we know, we know in general that spin correlation is not modeled perfectly. We have the 2019 Atlas spin correlation paper and the CMS spin correlation paper where we look at that, the, the delta phi in the lab frame. And you see that the no Monte Carlo generator is describing the spin correlations properly. And that's and that sensitivity of that observable is driven by the low MTT bar region. So it's not at all surprising here. We have like a three sigma tension with the 
with the Monte Carlo generators with the data in the in the spin correlation measurements, and it happens mostly due to in the it happens mostly at the low MTT bar with the likelihood gluons. So you expect to see it here as well. Yeah, it's a bit. I mean, it's, this is a bit annoying, right? That uh, so what the spin correlation is not yet they're not right, but now it, so it's. Uh, I mean, I agree. I, I yeah, did the other not, analysis as well. It was annoying then. Yeah, <laughs> and, and then uh, so for me the most annoying thing of all. Uh, I mean, if I had to find a, a possible thing for work more, is this, uh, you know, this calibration plot uh, um, made, uh, we discussed it with uh, uh, Joab uh, already. I mean, this is, uh, uh, it's really a, it's, I mean, it's, how do you say, a fix, right? I mean, it's something which is not uh, sound, so what, I mean, it's, Something that you have to do, you don't know how to do it, and you don't, and you do it. You this mean way. the how we change the entanglement? Yeah, or? I mean, yeah. this is uh, not satisfactory. That's yeah, I mean, ideally, what you would want to do, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to do this if you wanted to do unfolding, for example. You just unfold with the standard model expectation, but you'd still need to shift things somehow to check that your unfolding isn't biased. Yeah, but because so the, these calibration effects are huge, no? Or, or yeah. I'm well, okay. thinking it badly, or. Uh, you're like not reading it badly, but th the point is that these calibration effects look huge here because you're seeing them. They're often hidden in other analyses, and they're often bigger than this in other analyses. It's actually, I would say, quite well behaved by experimental standards for our unfolding. If you ever look in like an efficiency and acceptance curve for a differential cross-section or whatever, the, the extrapolations there are much higher than three, usually. Like, and this one is about a factor of three. But I agree it's not ideal. I mean, the, the scale of the x-axis is completely different from the scale of yeah, yeah. the y-axis. The, the, lim the limitation here, I should say, is or my, my opinion on what the limitation is on how to do this better or to fix it, is that all of the Monte Carlo generators that we currently have, the general purpose ones, almost all of them do a very hand wavy propagation of spin information as you go through. And even the file formats, even LHG files, don't have the full spin information in them. So the parton showers are kind of unless they generated the events themselves, they're kind of screwed from the beginning. They don't have access to the full spin density matrix, so they could never be preserving all the spin correlations properly in a formally correct way in the shower, so they have to do some approximations. Um, and yeah, they, the, if we wanted to, for example, a better way of doing this would be we could take this plot and say, okay, um, I don't know exactly what different entanglement would look like, but I know what would happen if I increase my QQ bar fraction, which is not um, which is not entangled uh, uh, in low MTT bar. I could try playing reweighting weighting games with this to change my entanglement in my sample in a way that might look reasonable. But even there, like the information to do this, this would work in a leading order Monte Carlo, but this would, it, how would you deal with the higher order diagrams in the next leading order Monte Carlo? You couldn't do this kind of simple reweighting here. You don't have these simple spin states. So I agree it's, it's, sub it's more than suboptimal the way we've attacked it, uh, the problem, but it's the only thing we could really do. All we can do is quantify what we think the response of the detector would be to different kinds of D. Um, and use that to build the calibration curve. Yeah, now that you've done, I mean, uh, now you're doing a unit test calibration. Say you uh, measure a G in QQ bar only. You, we have no way of isolating it um, from, the, from the, the events, right? We don't know, uh, the, uh, in the data, we couldn't say that one came, definitely came from glow and glow infusion, that one came from QQ bar. Uh, yes, we, so yeah, we could, we could isolate just the QQ bar in the Monte Carlo, but all our Monte Carlo is NLO, so we're relying on part on level information, and in most of these you have, you have, you have glue and glue on fine, you have QQ fine, but then you also have these Q glue states which are a bit weird, so the question is, okay, if I take these Q glue states out and just use a QQ bar in my NLO Monte Carlo, yeah, then I could build this calibration curve and see if it looks the same. And I think off the top of my head it should, because in the QQ bar, this, this, uh, this D parameter a uh, recoil level, a uh, truth level should be flat. So you'd just, you'd just be reweighting a flat distribution to have slightly more slope, and you would hope that you get the same calibration curve, but the points you get are all up here somewhere instead of down here, but the line should hopefully be the same. So it's, it's actually not a bad suggestion to test. Although I'm, I don't like playing with initial states in NLO generators, it no, often uses strange okay. things. I, the interesting thing is I have absolutely no idea how CMS have tackled this problem yet. I'm very curious to see how they've done it, but... <laughs> This was our attempt. <laughs> there may be other ones, but if there are, we don't know them. Okay. And you, you can ask them, they're not, they're not gonna tell you. <laughs> um, maybe we should close it here. I remember everyone that Jay will be answering questions also tomorrow because he's in the panel. So. Uh, yeah. So we start at 11 and we have a lecture.